Hello, everyone. Welcome to session seven of the ISJL virtual vacation. Before we begin, I just want to thank all of you for your enthusiastic support of this program. It is such a delight to explore this history and these amazing places with you. And I can't wait for you to join me in Mississippi, virtually, of course, for today's session. As always, please, please, please leave your questions and thoughts in the comments of this live stream. And I'm going to respond to as many as I can at the end of the session. Today, we're heading to Mississippi, where I currently am and where the ISJL is proudly based to learn about the civil rights movement and its deep roots here. I want to make sure that you know up front that this is a surface level overview of this history. There's so much to say, so much to unpack about this history, so many people that I want you to know about. And we're going to hear from my colleagues at the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University and the two Mississippi museums later in this session. So in preparing for the session, to give you a peek behind the curtain, I made some decisions. I'm gonna give you the highlights. I'm gonna introduce you to some big ideas and moments that you may already know about or that you may have sort of heard in passing. Um, and a lot of these are things that our wonderful interviewees are gonna talk about in a lot more detail later in the session. So if I'm giving you the surface level on someone, please know that it's because you're gonna learn more uh, in a few minutes. So I might really my goal is to set you up so that you have this history in your vocabulary and so that when you're going off to learn more and when you're hearing from our interviewees, um, things are going to make a little bit more sense for you. So I'm going to move chronologically through a lot of content so you can see sort of how these stories flow into each other. So the first big moment that I want to talk to you about the first key individual I want to talk to you about is Emmett Till. Emmett Till was born in Chicago in 1941. He planned to spend August of 1955 visiting family in the Mississippi Delta. Three days after he arrived, Emmett and eight other teenagers went to Bryant's grocery store and meat market in Money, Mississippi, owned by Roy and Carolyn Bryant, to buy bubble gum. All evidence points to this being a perfectly mundane interaction. Four days later, in the middle of the night, Roy Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Millam, kidnapped uh, Emmett from his uncle Moses Wright's home. They brutally tortured and then murdered him and threw him in the Tallahatchie River. And three days later, his body was found. So Bryant and Millam were arrested on kidnapping charges before the body was found. They were subsequently, subsequently charged with Emmett Till's murder. And then two important stories happened simultaneously. The first is the story of the trial. Carolyn Bryant, Roy's wife, claimed that Emmett Till whistled at her when he was inside the store and went on to claim that he had sort of propositioned her. She later recanted this testimony. There's no evidence that Emmett Till did anything out of the ordinary while in that store. And even if he had, he didn't deserve to be lynched. Everyone knows that Bryant and Millam are guilty. Uh, a few days into the trial, Moses Wright, who uh, watched Emmett be kidnapped, stood up and in court and pointed to the two men who kidnapped his nephew, which is an incredibly dangerous and courageous act. Two days later, the all-white jury finds Millam and Bryant not guilty. The murderers go free. The case makes international news. And a few years later, knowing that they can't be put on trial again for the same crime, the murderers sell their testimony to Look Magazine. But there's also a second story uh, happening at the same time. A key reason that Emmett Till's murder became the catalyst that it did was that his mother's insistence that the funeral be held in Chicago with an open casket. Thousands of people attended his funeral. Millions saw photographs of his body published in Jet Magazine a few days later. And there was international rage and despair and the eyes of the world turned to Mississippi. People, and especially Black people across the country, transformed this rage into concrete action. And this is one of the key moments that is really sort of the beginning of the classical civil rights movement, these horrifying images of Emmett Till's body as a starting point for so many people's activism. Emmett Till is murdered in 1955. Brown versus Board of Education is 1954. So right around this time, um, a lot of folks are sort of ramping up their activism for civil rights. And the legacy of Emmett Till really is the modern civil rights movement. One of the people who helped investigate the case was Medgar Evers, who was assassinated by a white supremacist eight years later. And Mississippi was in many ways the heart of the movement and Emmett Till's death is part of the reason for that. So that is Emmett Till in an extreme nutshell. There's a lot more to be said about him. 
I also want to point you to another moment seven years later in 1962. Uh, this is James Meredith in the center of this picture. In 1962, James Meredith became the first Black person to enroll at the University of Mississippi. He was met with immense resistance and violence by police, by university administration, by fellow students. Um, he ultimately graduated with a degree in political science, and he's going to remain a really important figure in this history. Again, so much more to be said about him, but I want you to know his name. So uh, another key moment uh, happens the year prior. Uh, and these are the freedom rides. In 1960, there's a Supreme Court decision, Boynton versus Virginia, that rules that segregated interstate bus stations are unconstitutional. So to test the enforcement of this ruling, members of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, organized a bus ride from Washington, D.C. through the South. They had essentially no issues in terms of resistance in South Carolina and Georgia. They began to face violence in Alabama, especially in Anniston. And core riders stopped in Birmingham um, and riders from SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who we learned a lot about uh, when we were in Selma, took up the mantle. And President Kennedy reached an agreement with the then governor of Mississippi, Ross Barnett, that he would arrest the riders without violence. By June of 1961, there were 329 riders arrested. They flooded city and county jails. Um, the men were moved to Parchman Penitentiary up in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, the women went on hunger strike to be granted equal treatment. And so eventually all of the freedom riders who had been violently arrested in Jackson uh, were moved to Parchman Penitentiary for that summer. And there's another person who I want you to know about in this history, uh, who we've heard about a little bit before, and that's Rabbi Perry Nussbaum. So he's the rabbi at Beth Israel Congregation in Jackson. And like many of his colleagues, he didn't necessarily approve of the Freedom Riders methods. He was wary of Northerners coming South, causing problems for people in the South who were already working for civil rights. Um, but Nussbaum sort of changed his tune when he saw the treatment of the Freedom Riders. He drove to Parchman weekly, a long drive, to provide counsel to riders who were in horrendous conditions. He wrote letters to friends and family members um, of the Freedom Riders, regardless of whether or not they were Jewish. Um, and he really, um, this, was, this was a courageous and, and compassionate uh, a thing for him to do. He does face some retaliation for this later in the 60s. In 1967, so several years later, um, there's a, a bomb uh, is set off at Beth Israel Congregation. And a few months later, um, Rabbi Nussbaum's home is also bombed. And he had been someone outspoken about desegregation and Black civil rights. And this curtailed his activism a little bit, right? Because he saw that there was a real threat um, to his well-being for speaking out. Again, so much more to be said about this. We're barreling through. <laughs> so the next thing that I really want you to know about is uh, a couple of years following uh, the Freedom Rides, a year after um, James Meredith um, enrolls at the University of Mississippi, and this is the Freedom Vote. So I wanna introduce you to a couple of key organizations that you may have heard about a little bit. The first is SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. SNCC is founded in 1960. It's inspired by sort of student protests, protests, sit-ins. Um, they play a significant role in the March on Washington in 1963. And they're all about sort of grassroots voting rights efforts protests and participatory democracy. And they worked throughout the South um, with their sort of most concentrated efforts in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Now there's another organization that's unique to Mississippi called COFO or the Council of Federated Organizations. And this is sort of a coalition of the Mississippi branches of the four major civil rights organizations that were active here at that time. And those are the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinate, Coordinating Committee, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. So COFO is doing a lot of really cool and interesting organizing that we're gonna learn more about later in the session. But so now it's 1963 in our extremely fast timeline. There are only 12,000 black people in the state of Mississippi who are registered to vote, which is a tiny, tiny percentage. Um, there are mass protests about this in Greenwood, Mississippi that spark this sort of statewide voter registration effort. And there's this belief among white people that black people just don't want to vote. And so why bother making it easy for them to register? This is a, a, just a wild, wildly racist position to take. Um, so COFO decided to prove them wrong with what they called the freedom vote. So the idea of this was to show the federal government and the entire country that black people 
would show up to vote in huge numbers if they were able to register without intimidation and discrimination and vote without intimidation and discrimination. So COFO planned to educate and register Black Mississippians to vote in a mock election for governor. So they had Aaron Henry, who's in this photograph, uh, running for governor, Reverend N. King running for lieutenant governor. This is an enormous campaign. 83,000 Mississippians cast their ballots in a mock election. And this laid the foundation for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which we're going to learn about in a second. Also in 1963, we see the assassination of Medgar Evers, who we're also going to learn about more later. Um, this was really a turning point, uh, another turning point in a history filled with turning points. Um, Medgar Evers was a civil rights activist. He was the field secretary for the, Missis for the Mississippi uh, NAACP. He did a lot of incredible sort of organizing work for, for many years prior to his assassination. He was murdered by a white supremacist in his driveway in 1963. We're going to learn a little bit more about Medgar Evers later on in the session. I have promised you that I'm going to barrel through and we are going to. So now it's the summer of 1964. COFO, again, the Council of Federated Organizations, under the leadership of Bob Moses and others, recruited nearly a thousand college age students, mostly from the North, to join the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement for 10 weeks. The idea was to get disenfranchised Black voters and young Mississippians involved in the Civil Rights Movement and to get enough black voters registered to unseat the all white Mississippi Democratic Party at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey that August. So the idea was to replace the all white Mississippi Democratic Party caucus with the black and white delegates of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And they made the argument that because of black voter suppression, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP, was the only democratically elected party in the state of Mississippi. So at this point, just 2% of eligible Black voters are registered to vote. So there are huge voter registration drives throughout Freedom Summer. Um, and voter suppression not only means that Black people can't vote, it means that there are no Black politicians, but it also means that there are no Black people on juries, because to serve on a jury, you have to be registered to vote. And so if you're a Black person who is accused of a crime and you are put on trial and there's an all-white jury, Essentially, 10 times out of 10, the all white jury is going to convict you regardless of whether or not you've actually committed the crime. And so in order to have a jury of one's peers, that is a jury that actually represents the racial makeup of the state, uh, you need black people to be able to register to vote and therefore serve on juries. So this is all of these things are interconnected. Freedom Summer also sees the development of freedom schools. Um, Freedom schools had this goal of sort of fostering intellectual curiosity and academic skills in a state where 10 years after Brown versus Board, there was not a single black student sharing a classroom with a white student. And these schools were meant to teach black kids about the legacy of black resistance, engage them in black culture and black intellectual traditions and provide remedial tutoring in reading, writing and math. And there were 45 freedom schools that served 2,100 students. This is a huge, huge effort. There's a, there are so many different pieces to this um, that, I, that I would love to talk about at length in more detail. But one that I'm gonna highlight are the freedom school newspapers. So these are produced by some of the youth who are in these freedom schools, mostly sort of in the 13 to 15 age range. Freedom summer volunteers, um, many of them were white college students from up north. Um, or black college students from up north um, who worked on their school co or their college newspapers. And so they were sort of leading this effort, but really the students had enormous amounts of aut autonomy about the form and the content of the newspapers. And they became a really important tool for activism and an important contribution to this really long tradition of black print culture. Um, we don't hear about the Freedom School newspapers enough and I love to talk about them. So then there's a moment in Freedom Summer that many folks may have heard of, and that's the murder of James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. So James Cheney is a Black Mississippian who worked for COFO. Andrew Goodman is a Jewish Freedom Summer volunteer from New York. Michael Schwerner is a Jewish COFO field organizer, also from New York. All of them are in their early 20s. They went to investigate a church bombing near Philadelphia, Mississippi, um, before the rest of the Freedom Summer volunteers had arrived in Mississippi. Uh, the other volunteers were still in training in Ohio at this point. Um, they were arrested. These three men were arrested on an alleged traffic violation. Um, and then they were released the same night, essentially into the arms of the Ku Klux Klan. And they were never heard from again. 
And Goodman and Schwerner represent the hundreds of Jews who volunteered for Freedom Summer. The estimate is that about half of the white Freedom Summer volunteers were Jewish, which is a huge, huge ratio. So the FBI descends on Mississippi. And this is specifically because two of the victims are white Northerners. Um, their, their bodies were discovered six weeks later. This moment early on in the summer as volunteers were being trained and getting settled in is a crystallizing one. Um, organizers had been telling these volunteers that injury and death were real risks. Um, and this uh, made that bright and clear. Um, and Bob Moses, who was leading Freedom Summer and leading some of the training at this point, gathered everyone together and told them that, that they could call home and decide not to go to Mississippi. Um, and I believe that no one took him up on that. Uh, everyone went. So over the course of Freedom Summer, at least three other civil rights workers were murdered. Uh, volunteers also experienced 1,000 arrests, 80 beatings, 35 shooting incidents, and 30 bombings of homes, churches, and schools. So the violence to this summer of education and voter registration, the violent response to this is enormous. All of this is also happening as the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is gaining power. So the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, or the MFDP, as I will abbreviate it now, drew the attention and sympathy of Northern liberals. 60,000 Black people signed up for the MFDP. So now it's later in the summer. It's in August of 1964. The Democratic National Convention is in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It appeared that the Credentials Committee was willing to seat the MFDP, but the effort failed because delegations from other Southern states threatened to leave the convention rather than share the floor with the MFDP. So they reach a compromise that they're gonna give two seats to MFDP delegates, uh, but the delegates left the convention rather than accept the compromise. And Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the leaders of the party said, we didn't come all this way for no two seats because all of us is tired. So speaking of Fannie Lou Hamer, again, barreling through, <laughs> she is a giant in this history. She's someone whose name you're gonna hear a lot in our interviews for this session. She was a sharecropper in the Mississippi Delta who faced incredible violence when she repeatedly tried to register to vote. And she got involved in SNCC. She became a powerful voice for change, both as an orator, she was an amazing speaker, and as a singer, she had a, a beautiful singing voice. And she helped found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And she gave this amazing speech, really speaking truth to power at the Democratic National Convention. All right. So now it's 1966, we remember James Meredith who uh, helped desegregate the University of Mississippi in 1962. So now it's 1966. James Meredith organizes a march from through Mississippi uh, to fight racism and to encourage African-Americans to vote. There was still an incredible amount of discrimination and intimidation when African-Americans uh, tried to register to vote or tried to vote. On the second day of his march, which was planned to be 220, 207 miles, excuse me, a white man shot Meredith. And immediately, uh, Meredith survived, uh, immediately civil rights leaders rallied around him to continue, to continue the march. SNCC activists used the march to build grassroots power and register black people to vote. It becomes known as the March Against Fear. And this moment also saw the popularization of the term black power. Um, SNCC had been using the phrase sort of black power for black people for a little while, um, but on the march, sort of the condensed version of that was popularized by Willie Ricks and Stokely Carmichael. And this is really a turning point in the tactics used by the civil rights movement adopting sort of this black power uh, tactic. Um, police met the march with incredible violence, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, teams of organizers worked with communities along the route to get them involved in activism, to have them help support the marchers in this 220 mile walk. Um, 15,000 participants um, participated in the last part of the march heading into Jackson on June 26, 1966, uh, making it the largest civil rights march in history. So again, this is a super, super, super broad strokes overview of this story with some spotlights shining on people and moments that you're gonna about to hear about in more detail. And I spoke with colleagues who are doing the important work of interpreting and sharing this history right here in Jackson, Mississippi. So first I spoke to Dr. Robbie Luckett. He is an associate professor of history at Jackson State University. He's the director of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State. You're gonna hear a little bit more from him um, about his, his, his work. 
We spoke about Margaret Walker's literary legacy, the story of civil rights organizing at Jackson State, and the urgent relevance of this history in the present. And next, I spoke to John Spann. John is the curator of education and interpretation at the two Mississippi museums, uh, which comprise the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. John is an incredible civil rights educator. And we spoke about the development of the museums, the stories that he loves to share, and the experience of working with veterans of the movement. And he also highlighted the importance of understanding Reconstruction and Jim Crow in order to fully grasp the history of the civil rights movement. So I'm really excited for all of you uh, to meet the two of them now. Yeah, so um, my name's Robbie Luckett. I'm an associate professor of history at Jackson State University. I've been there for 12 years. My scholarship focuses on the modern civil rights movement, specifically in Mississippi. I teach civil rights and African-American history at Jackson State, which is a historically black college here in Mississippi, in Jackson. And I also have a joint appointment as director of the Margaret Walker Center, which is a special collections archive and museum on campus that was founded by the writer, poet, novelist, essayist, Margaret Walker, back in 1968 when she was on the faculty here uh, at Jackson State. She founded us as the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People. She called it her Black Studies Institute. It was really kind of at the forefront of the Black Studies movement. And that's where our niche is today. And that's the, the work that we primarily do as a, as a Black Studies Research Center. Um, we also operate uh, the COFO Civil Rights Education Center on campus, which was in 1964, COFO was the Council of Federated Organizations, an umbrella civil rights group that organizes um, Freedom Summer in 1964, and, and that space today, that was the state headquarters for COFO and as a museum that we operate as well on campus. So we do a lot of public history work, a lot of engagement with community and with visitors around civil rights, but also Black studies and Black arts movement and things like that. Margaret Walker is just this incredible woman, um, born to well-educated and sophisticated parents in 1915. She's raised in New Orleans. Her dad was a professor at what is now Dillard University. Her mother was a musician. We have this great picture in the 20s of her mother with her concert orchestra. Um, she actually directed, um, it's pretty beautiful. When she was young, 13, um, Langston Hughes comes to speak at, uh, at what is now Dillard University and her parents take her to see him. And this is 1928, so we're talking the height of the Harlem Renaissance. This is Langston Hughes, and Margaret is 13 years old. And her parents make her get in line to have a, a book sign and to meet him. And they also want, him, want her to give to Langston Hughes poetry she's been writing. She's 13. You can imagine the quality of the poetry. Um, so she gets in the line to do this and is too embarrassed uh, to do it. Um, her parents make her get back in line and do it again. Uh, and this time she does, and Langston Hughes becomes her mentor uh, and, and really sets Margaret on a path that is pretty remarkable over the course of the 20th century. By the time Margaret's 18, she gets her first poem published, thanks to Langston Hughes and the NAACP's Crisis Magazine, and Du Bois is her editor. It's 1933, she's 18, Du Bois is her editor, and Langston Hughes is getting her published in the crisis. That's the type of world Margaret lived in and the company she kept. She's gonna to go to Northwestern, get her undergraduate degree at Northwestern in the 30s, stay in Chicago, become deeply involved in the Chicago Renaissance and also during the Great Depression, the, um, the Federal Writers Project and get to know everybody who was anybody in that black art world of the, of the 30s. Eventually going, uh, leaving Chicago, going to the University of Iowa, getting her master's degree at the University of Iowa. Her master's thesis will be her classic book of poetry for my people. And it's going to win the Yale Younger Poets Prize in 1942, which is going to launch her into international fame. The problem for Margaret in 1942, well, problem, um, is that she gets married and she has a family. And her husband is actually a disabled World War II vet. And they're going to have four kids. But Margaret, as famous as she is as a writer, needs a settled job. She needs something to be able to take care of the family. And as famous as she was, if, if she, today she could make a living and, and sustain a family as a writer, at that point, as a black woman who's the breadwinner for her family, 
she really needs something more stable. So she starts teaching and gets a job at Jackson State in 1949. And she comes here on a one-year appointment in 1949. This is an incredibly well-educated black woman, award-winning poet, internationally renowned. And she comes by herself because she thought, this is only a one-year job. I may have to go back. Left her husband and two older kids in North Carolina where they had been living. And her two youngest kids go to live with her parents in New Orleans. She stays the rest of her career at Jackson State. She'll stay until 1979, 30 years, and live in Jackson until she dies in 1998. So fully 49 years, she's going to end up staying here uh, in Jackson. And along the way, she's going uh, to have um, on her street, neighbors will move in a few years after her. That would be the civil rights activist Medgar Evers and his wife Marley Evers. Medgar would, of course, be assassinated in 1963 on that street, the same street that Margaret um, lived on. Uh, and Medgar's office, the NAACP offices in Mississippi to this day are right next to our campus. And so Medgar and Margaret literally worked and lived on the same streets in Jackson. His assassination deeply impacts her. Three years after his assassination, she publishes her great novel, Jubilee, which is this classic Civil War era narrative of her great grandmother and grandmother living from slavery to freedom and it really launches a genre of fiction called neo-slave narratives um, that takes the perspective in this case specifically of black women as being the primary drivers of the narrative and it, it, it's going to launch uh, the future books like um, beloved, right, and roots and, and this is the genre of fiction that Margaret starts in 1966 living in Jackson, Mississippi, on the same street Medgar had just been assassinated on three years earlier. And then in 1968, she founds her Black Studies Institute, which is really remarkable when you consider Black Studies as an academic field on the college level, and, and especially in terms of when we think about Black Studies, African American Studies, Africana Studies as majors, um, that really begins in the late 60s from young civil rights activists saying, we want to study Black history and culture. And the first program that's often credited with being a Black studies program on a college campus is at San Francisco State in 1968. The same year, Margaret's doing that work in, in Jackson. And I would just submit that Jackson, Mississippi in 1968 and San Francisco in 1968 are two very different places. Um, not the least of which is the fact that Martin Luther King is assassinated three hours away from Jackson, right, um, in 68. And so um, the, the Institute becomes um, her focus, her very direct legacy. Um, she's going to host some of the first conferences on Black Studies here um, at Jackson State. She goes on to do really remarkable work through the Institute. And when she retires in 1979, we become named for our founder and thus uh, today the Margaret Walker Center. And we continue that legacy and continue that work in a, a very proud one that's incredibly rich. So much more I could say about Margaret, but um, just a remarkable woman who more people need to, need to know about. So uh, the COFO Civil Rights Education Center is really a, a special place and COFO itself was unique to Mississippi. It didn't exist anywhere else. The Council of Federated Organizations, this umbrella civil rights group, really was the brainchild of the great activist Bob Moses, who's still alive. Um, and, and he had this idea, let's take all of these groups doing this work in Mississippi, and why don't we organize ourselves? And why don't we work together? Which was slightly revolutionary in the sense that these organizations did not always get along. They were often competing, competing with resources, competing over strategies and tactics. And so the four, the four big ones that he brings under this umbrella includes the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which Bob Moses worked for, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, Dr. King's organization, and, and, and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and SCLC, Dr. King's group, they often butted heads over these issues. And so to have those two under one uh, kind of roof was pretty remarkable. Also included the NAACP, of course, in Mississippi, that was driven by Medgar Evers, um, who just was you know, one of our most important grassroots activists ever in the history of the state of Mississippi. 
Uh, and then CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was the fourth one. CORE was probably best known by that time for organizing the Freedom Rides in 1961 that had ended in Jackson with 329 people arrested over the course of the summer of 1961. So you had these four big groups and to really organize them and bring them together was um, a Herculean task. Um, and, and really, I think a lot of that credit goes to the leadership that was in Mississippi. It goes to Bob Moses um, and, and his kind of spirit that was very much informed by the likes of Ella Baker, this very kind of democratized notion of decentralized power and, and bringing people together and not, not having a, a, a leader driven movement, but to have a movement driven by the people um, and, and Medgar Evers and folks like Fannie Lou Hamer and, and, and uh, the list goes on and on, but the, the strength and the spirit of the people doing the work in Mississippi that was often considered the most dangerous state in the nation um, for, for civil rights activists. And there's a, a long history there that we can talk about and go into. And I think it's primarily rooted in the fact that we had a majority black population until World War II. And for Jim Crow and white supremacy to sustain itself, it had to do so in a state where, where whites were the, in the minority with extreme violence um, and um, oppression. And so, and, and that includes leading the nation in the total number of known lynchings, right? I mean, that's Mississippi. Um, but you have these people and, um, and under kind of the strength and vision that, that they had for the movement here, they bring these groups together and they begin organizing in 1961. They opened the statewide headquarters in 1963. The first big thing that they do is to organize what they would call a freedom vote. Uh, it, the, of course, the Voting Rights Act had not passed. Um, it's only about 6% of African Americans were registered to vote in a state where they were half the population. Um, and part of the kind of the white supremacist myth was, why would you want black people to register to vote? They won't vote even if you registered them, right? That was the, the white supremacist thinking. And so COFO had this idea, we're going to organize a freedom vote. And it's going to follow the 1963 election and we'll let anybody who'd be eligible to vote vote in it and we'll see how it goes and just to show that black people were interested in voting and 80,000 black mississippians participated in the freedom vote in 1963 in a mock election just just <laughs> remarkable and, and even in a mock election like that you do so at some risk to yourself in a place like mississippi this was a dangerous thing to do to show up and to be counted in that way. And so it really showed that they were on to something and that would lead, of course, in 1964 to what was known then as the Mississippi Summer Project. We better know it as Freedom Summer. And the idea was that you would bring these 800 college students roughly up to, they were hoping to get upwards of a thousand, ended up being closer to 800 um, from around the country to come to Mississippi and spend the summer doing voter registration work. Um, also Freedom Schools, which were the brainchild of, of Charlie Cobb, who's activists are still alive as well. Um, let's teach reading, writing, math to anybody who wants to learn it, uh, you know, and, but also black history and culture and black art and literature. Um, but they did other things too. You had um, freedom cooperatives creating economy for poor black people in Mississippi over the course of that summer, particularly black women who were producing home goods like quilts and foodstuffs and things like that. Um, Freedom Farms, let's grow food for hungry people and, and let's give it to them. Um, you also had a, a thing called the Free Southern Theater um, that provided free public theater for poor people in Mississippi. Um, just uh, So they were doing lots of work over the course of that summer. Um, and it was um, incredibly dangerous work and most infamously at the very outset of the summer, um, three civil rights workers were kidnapped and uh, brutally murdered, um, Andy Goodman, Mickey Schwerner, and James Cheney. And of course, their disappearance made that summer um, much more fraught with fear and um, legitimately so. Um, and yet these 800 activists still come to Mississippi to do this work, which just as a remarkable testimony to their courage. Sometimes I hear people describe them as fearless and I think that's not the right word because I think these people were definitely afraid, um, but the, the courage that they exhibited in the, in the face of that fear is something that is quite remarkable. And then um, kind of coming out of that summer too, 
um, was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, highlighted by Fannie Lou Hamer and the attempt to unseat what was an all-white Mississippi Democratic Party at the Democratic National Convention in 1964 in Atlantic City. Um, they lost that bid, but it's going to launch Fannie Lou Hamer into kind of worldwide renown as, as an activist and a leader uh, here in Mississippi. And so all of that is to say is that that work was organized out of this space on our campus um, and just really a block off the main part of campus. And uh, for the past, better, better part of the past decade, Jackson State has operated that space as the COFO Civil Rights Education Center. And it, it is a museum, it is a place you can come and you can stand in this space um, where these great you know, heroes and, and sheroes of the movement um, stood. One of my favorite things is when you come inside, there's this, this beautiful image on the wall of Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and Dorothy Cotton and the, the team from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference attending a meeting in 1964 in the room you're sitting in. And what you, you understand, you're looking at this image and you're standing in the same space. It gives you really a, a sense of the power of place. Um, and so we welcome people from around the world uh, to, to that space, literally around the world, um, and have just been very lucky to see um, so many people interested in, in, in learning about civil rights history and heritage in Mississippi and about the COFO Center. And I'd say the other big thing that we do through COFO is um, in the spirit of what COFO was originally founded for, we've also opened our doors to, to community groups and organizations doing good work um, around social justice, human dignity, um, racial equality. Um, and so we frequently ha are having community meetings in our building and inviting those groups to use our space as it had been used in the 1960s. Of course, COVID has thrown a monkey wrench into all of that. We've had to kind of, that's been closed down uh, uh, since March. Um, but we're hoping in January we'll be able to reopen those doors to some of those meetings. At least that's the plan right now and bring, bring visitors back into that space. So it's, uh, COFO is really just a, a, a special, special place and a, a wonderful um, part of the portfolio of work that we do through the Margaret Walker Center. Yeah, so in um, May of 1970, um, there were a series of, of student-led protests on our campus that had been going on every spring since 1964. There was a, a main street that ran through the middle of our campus, John R. Lynch Street, was named for a, a black man who had been a former slave who becomes a United States congressman for Mississippi during Reconstruction. And Lynch Street was often used as a thoroughfare for white motorists driving from the suburbs of West Jackson into downtown. And frequently there would be incidents between white motorists and Jackson State students. When these motorists would drive through campus, they would shout racist epithets, not surprisingly. Sometimes they would throw things out their car at students. And one day in 1964, they actually hit a young Jackson State student, Mamie Ballard Crockett. Um, and uh, Mamie Ballard survived, she's still alive today. But the, the students began protesting the uh, John R. Lynch Street and demanding that it be closed through our campus um, because of these, these incidents. And I would, uh, you know, the tenor of these protests, and they would happen every spring, so 64, 65, 66, 67 students would come back and keep um, that anniversary of Mamie Ballard being hit, you know, demanding this close. By the mid to late 60s, the tenor of these protests were not nonviolent. Um, and, and I say not nonviolent, not to suggest they were violent, um, to suggest that they didn't follow kind of the nonviolent direct action model of Gandhian nonviolence that Dr. King promoted. Uh, instead, by this time in the mid to late 60s, if you threw something at a black student on our campus, they were going to throw something back at you, right? <laughs> there was not going to be this. Um, um, just kind of peaceful acceptance of, of that type of physical abuse. Um, and again, it didn't mean that they were violent. It just meant you know, that they are espousing um, tactics and strategies that were embedded in, in notions of self-defense. Also black power, which gets uh, coined and started as a, as a philosophy in Mississippi in 1966 during the Meredith March Against Fear um, by Willie Ricks and Stokely Carmichael, two SNCC activists this idea that James Meredith was gonna march from Memphis to Jackson to show black people that they should register vote and would have nothing to fear. 
James Meredith gets shot in the back on the second day of his march. Um, and all these activists come to take up that mantle. Man James Meredith survives. He's also still alive uh, today. And we see him around Jackson um, fairly often. He lives in my neighborhood. Sometimes I see him walking down the street. The students um, would lead these, um, these protests. And by 1970, they had become um, pretty strident in those demands. And at one point on the night of Thursday, May 14th, 1970, someone, there, we don't have any evidence of who it was, and we don't know if it was a Jackson State student or not. There's no indication that it was a Jackson State student, but someone commandeered a dump truck and parked it in the middle of John R. Lynch Street, a couple of blocks down from campus, not right in the middle of campus, and they set it on fire. And so this dump truck is on fire in the middle of John R. Lynch Street in the middle of the night. There are no other protests going on, just this truck that's been parked here to block traffic, right? Like this, this is the type of, of, of protest that is going on. In the middle of the night that night, May 14th, city police and highway patrol, after the dump truck has been set on fire and put out, they march on campus in full riot gear. And I would just be very careful in how we use the word riot here because it's often been associated with Jackson State students as a means of blaming them for what would happen next. But if anyone was rioting that night, it was in fact the police. Um, they're gonna march on campus accompanied by what was known as the Thompson Tank. Alan Thompson had been the segregationist mayor of Jackson who purchased the Thompson Tank ahead of Freedom Summer in 1964 for what he called the invasion of civil rights activists that summer. It was a fully armored personnel carrier. They come on campus, they march past the burned out dump truck, and they come up right in the middle of campus on John R. Lynch Street in their full riot gear in front of Alexander Hall, which was a, a woman's dormitory. It's actually a woman's dorm to this day on our campus. They turn to face um, Alexander Hall, and we're pretty certain the evidence indicates that one of the Jackson State students threw a bottle at the police. Um, the bottle burst at their feet and they opened fire and they're gonna fire nearly 500 rounds of ammunition in 28 seconds into a woman's dorm. No one was protesting. There was no, nothing going on on campus. It was almost midnight on the night of Thursday, May 14th when that happened. Um, Miraculously, only two people were murdered, Philip Gibbs and James Green. Um, Philip Gibbs was a junior political science major at Jackson State, and James Green was a, a senior at nearby Jim Hill High School. The police claimed there had been a sniper on the fourth floor of the women's dormitory, which was absurd. It's been completely debunked, as if snipers just hang out in women's dorms waiting to, for a chance for police to come on campus in riot gear so they could take pot shots at them. Um, but that was another another means of blaming the, the victims and all of this. Um, for uh, Philip Gibbs, um, he was standing in front of Alexander Hall when he was shot and killed. Uh, James Green was actually on the opposite side of the street, which means the police had to fire in the total opposite direction from where there was the supposed sniper to kill James Green, which gives you some indication of their, their intentions. Um, Twelve other people were shot that night. And, and dozens and dozens are, are wounded. You can imagine the flying debris, the brick and the glass that's just exploding all over. This is midnight on a Thursday night on a college campus. Kids were just hanging out. Um, the police immediately um, picked up all their shell casings and left. No one was ever um, charged um, with a crime. The families did try to sue the city and the state of Mississippi in a civil lawsuit, which went all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost. Um, and so there was never uh, any justice for the murders of Philip Gibbs and James Green on our campus in 1970. For a number of years now, the Margaret Walker Center has been responsible for commemorating the Gibbs Green um, tragedy. Um, and of course, 1970 to 2020, this would have been the 50th commemoration this year. And we had spent the better part of about 18 months planning for the 50th commemoration. Um, not the least of which uh, was going to include two days of public events, but also at the spring 2020 commencement. In 1970, when the shootings happened, um, graduation had not happened yet. Campus was closed, students were sent home, and the class of 1970 didn't get to graduate. They were going to get to walk across the stage this past spring. They were going to get to get their diplomas for the, handed to them for the very first time, which would have been um, incredibly emotional.
And um, I was very happy uh, to nominate and see awarded honorary doctorates to Philip Gibbs and James Green, the two young men um, who were murdered. And those were gonna be bestowed on their families um, at commencement. Of course, all that gets canceled um, um, and we end up having to do um, a virtual public event with some of the survivors that I moderated that is available on the Margaret Walker Center um, Facebook page, Jackson State Facebook page. Um, you can also find, if you just Google Gibbs Green and Jackson State, there's a whole website that we've developed with a, uh, an exhibit, a uh, virtual exhibit and the, and the events up there as well. And so um, for me as a civil rights historian, um, of course, the importance of Gibbs Green is for us to understand that um, the, the history um, of this oppressive violence aimed at specifically black communities, but marginalized communities generally in America is nothing new. That it, when we talk about the, the buzzword these days of systemic oppression, it's in understanding our history that we understand how it's systemic and, and where it has existed throughout American history. And Jackson State is, and what happened in 1970 is a very clear indication of that. And then just a couple of weeks after the, the 50th commemoration, you get George Floyd's murder. Um, and so all of a sudden it becomes that much more relevant um, to, to today, right? And we see a very direct, um, a, a linear connection between Gibbs Green and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, right? Um, and and uh, it has, I would say, also dramatically increased um, interest in the work that we do at the Margaret Walker Center around Gibbs Green, but also around these issues um, of, uh, of social justice and, um, you know, systemic uh, racism. And um, that's uh, kind of a, uh, you know, not really the, the, what you want to be blessed with, but um, it's work that we're proud to do and um, happy to be engaged in and, and continuing to do. The thing that I, I hope people, when they learn about Margaret's story, when they learn about COFO, they learn about the movement, that, that the work that was being done here, um, one, was tackling a, a system of oppression that has been deeply rooted throughout American history. And wherever we have seen oppression in American history, we have also seen resistance um, to that oppression. And, and I think those two go hand in hand throughout American history. So um, I, I would take that away, you know, that not only are is the work that's been done and that continues to be done in Mississippi um, fighting a, a force of white supremacy that has been overwhelmingly powerful, but there has been resistance to that oppression that has been righteous and um, um, it holds lessons for us all. Um, but then two, I would also suggest that we should know that, that the story of Mississippi, that the story of Margaret Walker, that the story of COFO must be situated in an American context and not just a Mississippi one. Um, that Mississippi is a part of America. Um, my, um, one of my old um, grad school um, uh, mentors is a wonderful historian named Jim Cobb who wrote a book about the Mississippi Delta called The Most Southern Place on Earth. And in it, he suggests that the Mississippi Delta, he has this great quote, and th this is paraphrased, but it's pretty close. Um, the Mississippi Delta is much a part of the world as it is a world apart. Um, and, and his suggestion here and throughout that book is how Mississippi is created by America in an American context with um, uh, the collusion uh, of the nation, right? And, and, and I think that in the, the world of George Floyd, right, and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, we see how this is a national story and not just specifically a Deep South one. There's this notion in the scholarship of, of what's called Southern exceptionalism. And it's this idea that somehow the South is different than the rest of the country, which lets the rest of the country off the hook for their own racism and white supremacy and own issues. Um, and, that, and that they can blame the South for everything that's bad uh, without taking any responsibility kind of on a national level. And so I, I hope people um, leave the work that we do and realize 
that that this is part of a larger American story and that wherever you are, wherever you live, you can look in your own backyard and, and find this history and find work to do, right? Um, and find ways to engage in, in whatever motivates you, whatever drives you, whether it's um, voter suppression, whether it's um, racialized violence, police reform, whatever like is your, your cause, there may be multiple causes, you're going to find it where you are in America and there's work to be done there. We're most active on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and keep an eye out for programming um, in the spring particularly right now. Of course, the class of 2020 now shares with the class of 1970 at Jackson State the distinction of being the only two classes not to get to have a graduation. Um, 2021 spring, probably early summer, we're planning to do a special graduation ceremony just for those two classes, 70 and, and 20. Um, but we'll have a lot more programming and, and other uh, things coming along so people can connect, they can learn, they can hear about the work we got going on. So uh, my name is John Spann. I am curator of education and interpretation for the two Mississippi museums. The two Mississippi Museums is a museum that encompasses the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and the Museum of Mississippi History. The Museum of Mississippi History tells the depth or a breadth of Mississippi history from uh, prehistoric uh, Native American uh, history, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Bayagula, Natchez, uh, the first peoples of the state, all the way to the modern era, uh, to modern times, and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum dives deeper into the civil rights movement of Mississippi and focuses on the time period of 1945 to 1975 uh, and highlighting the unknown stories of the people who are unsung, who made not only Mississippi ground zero for the civil rights movement, but also helped change the nation uh, when it comes to civil rights activity uh, and, and pushing the, civil right, the, the message of the civil rights movement forward. When you come through the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, the first gallery called Mississippi Freedom Struggle gives you an overview of the enslavement of African Americans or Africans in the state of Mississippi. We actually say that slavery was here long before statehood. And as we know, Mississippi became a state in 1817, but the first enslaved peoples were brought into the Mississippi Territory around 1721. So uh, that is a good, um, that's a good thing that we like to, to tell people to get, kind of get in perspective how serious slavery was to the economy of the state. By 1860, you have um, half, half or more than half of Mississippi's population uh, enslaved uh, peoples, right? And so that sets you up for one of my favorite uh, things to get into in the museum is reconstruction because when you go into the next gallery called Mississippi in Black and White, it really lays out uh, the Reconstruction period and the Jim Crow period in black and white uh, of how that was a how that was done in Mississippi. So one of the things I like to share the stories of Hiram Rebels and Blanche Kelso Bruce, how these men, these African American men, uh, were able to become United States senators representing the state of Mississippi, like literally like ten years after the Civil War is over, and so. Um, with Hiram Rebels, I think, being, being uh, elected or appointed to the United States Senate uh, in about 1868. So that is a huge feat, you know, for not just uh, Mississippians, but for enslaved people or formerly enslaved people during that time. You now have the first African-American um, to be a United States senator represent the state of Mississippi, okay? And it is in 1868. And then from there, you have the Blanche Kelso Bruce, who was actually born a slave. Hiram Rebels was not born a slave. And as far as we know, his family members were not enslaved. But Blanche Kelso Bruce was, but he was not from Mississippi, just like Hiram Rebels. Blanche Kelso Bruce was a slave in Virginia. He was, um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, after the Civil War, he came to Jack, I mean, excuse me, not Jackson, but to Mississippi and was able to become tax collector and sheriff of Bolivar County. Mississippi before he becomes 
the first African-American United States Senator to serve a full term, and he represented Mississippi. So that's a, that, those two stories right there um, is something that I love to tell because a lot of people don't know that history. And when I know as a, as a high school student here in Mississippi, I was not really taught the depth of Reconstruction. I was only like taught the glanced over parts of, of Reconstruction. I'm not, not really just like the service level stuff. Um, another story that I really like to talk about is uh, the story of Mega Evers. There are three major catalysts to the modern civil rights movement. Um, I already mentioned Emmett Till being one, but you also have Brown v. Board of Education being another, and then you have World War II veterans, African-American World War II veterans coming home and, and fighting for freedom. Um, so men like Mega Evers, who actually fought in the war, came back and they are demanding freedom. They are thinking to themselves, it doesn't make sense that, that my, I'm good enough to die for this country, but I'm not good enough to vote for the people who are going to represent me in this country. I'm not good enough to sit in the front of the bus if I get there, you know, why, why, why do I have to move to the back of the bus? So you have a man like Megger Evers and his brother Charles Evers who, you know, they go to the courthouse. They're from Decatur, Mississippi. And the story that we tell is that they go to the, to the Decatur, uh, Mississippi courthouse to register to vote. When they get to the courthouse, they are met with opposition, white men with guns uh, who um, deter them from coming in. So they actually decide to go home and get their own weapons. So when they get their weapons, they're on their way back to the courthouse to have a fight, right? But before they get there, uh, Megger Evers and Charles Evers, you know, talk, the, talk it over and they realize that nothing good could come out of that, right? Um, death or jail or both or what have you. So they decided to call it off and they um, eventually went on to go to Alcorn State University and then from there, Mega Evers met Miss Murley Evers. They were able to get married, and then they moved to Mount Bayou, Mississippi, where Mega Evers started working for Dr. T.R.M. Howard, who was a uh, OBGYN uh, doctor at the Taborian um, Hospital there in Mount Bayou, and he also owned a insurance company. And Mega Evers actually worked in that insurance company. But in 1955, when uh, Emmett Till was lynched, uh, Mega Evers really got what we say baptized in the waters of civil rights during that um, during that trial because he was able or he and Dr. Howard were able to uh, go around uh, the Delta interviewing people, getting uh, statements from people who were witnesses or who knew what happened to Emmett Till, and also help um, house a lot of the witnesses and keep them safe during the trial to make sure that they were able to testify. And so from that, Mega Evers gets a crash course in uh, field reporting and, and being, the, being field secretary. And so that's how he gets catapulted into being the field secretary for the NAACP. So that's, those stories are just some things that we like to share. Um, also stories of like Miss Ella Baker and Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. Miss Ella Baker, a lot of people do not know her and she's not from Mississippi. But a lot of people, what we like to say is a lot of people you would not have know, you would not know of if it wasn't for Miss Ella Baker. Um, she would, she actually created the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and uh, what we know as SNCC. And from there, she helped set people up to for for good in the state of Mississippi. She helped organize from like the 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 shadows, if you will. Uh, different movements and, and put people in the right place to make a difference um, within Mississippi. And so that's how we know today uh, Mr. Bob Moses um, because of how she maneuvered things. And then also, you know, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer. A lot of people know her for her famous words, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, but um, she was much more than that. Uh, she, she was not just a farmer, she was much more than that. She was much more than a mother. Um, she was a, a drum major for civil rights, um, as um, Martin Luther King Jr. would say. I think she was also a um, drum major for civil rights, but also she was, her voice was not silenced and she would not allow her voice to be silenced. And uh, her experience of being a regular, you know, sharecropper in Mississippi, a regular, just a regular woman, and putting on 
and she was able to express how she felt, how she lived as a Mississippian uh, during the time of civil rights, during the time of Jim Crow, and really help other people who were not aware and really not even in that culture understand the pain and the plight of not just black people, but black women um, during the civil rights movement and in Mississippi. So uh, we credit a lot of things to the men in the movement, but if it wasn't for women like Miss Ella Baker and Miss Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, the movement wouldn't near be as, as famous or as strong as it was, um, as we know today. Yeah, so uh, we do have a lot of veterans still living, a lot of civil rights veterans still living from Mr. Hezekiah Watkins, who was the first, or excuse me, it's not the first, but the youngest, uh, youngest freedom rider arrested. Uh, he was arrested at 13 as a freedom rider. He actually is a colleague of mine. He works here at the museum with me. The impactful thing about that is that you have students who are, may or may not get an in-depth civil rights history in class, but when they come to the museum, they are truly in a classroom just, uh, you know, out of this world, if you will, uh, not comparable to anything they've ever seen. Because not only are they able to see the photographs, watch the videos, um, look at the artifacts, touch things, but now they're able to talk to living, breathing civil rights veterans who they, they see on the wall. They're able to see their pictures on the wall. And then that also brings into their perspective that, wow, this wasn't that long ago. These people are my grandparents' age. You know, these people um, lived in my neighborhood. These people were in the same areas that I'm still in today, and they were able to make a difference and make it better for me. So I think working with them and having them come in to do programming or, you know, do tours and things with students really drives home the message that these museums are, are trying to do. And that's, that's really to take Mississippi history out of these four walls and bring it into the communities and help all of us understand where we come from and how we can move forward using uh, the power of history, the power of education. The Biloxi Beach wait-ins, I, I think is kind of my favorite moments because I didn't really know about the wait-ins until I got to college. Yeah. And I actually started focusing my, my degree on civil rights. And so, yeah, just learning that the beaches here in Mississippi or the Biloxi beaches and, you know, on the Gulf Coast, those are man-made beaches paid for by the taxpayers of Mississippi. And um, they were still segregated. And then you had people like Dr. Gilbert Mason and Dr. Felix Dunn and Megger Evers work to create and organize these weigh-ins to protest segregation of tax-paid spaces or tax-paid, yeah, tax-paid spaces. And so, like, coming with the concept of, like, there's no such thing as segregated taxes. However, um, spaces paid for by taxpayers were. So just seeing how that was orchestrated and how even, like, the water was divided. Not only were like the libraries and the school divided, but the way, you know, the, the Gulf of Mexico was, was segregated. Just wild to me. So one thing that I, I do on my tours is I really focus in on our second gallery, which is called Mississippi in Black and White, that um, talks about reconstruction and Jim Crow era. The, the thing that I would wish that everybody knew was that the same things that the same things that were gained during Reconstruction for African Americans through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, the right to vote, the right to be a citizen, uh, abolishment of slavery, um, and just the, the right to have, you know, to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for African Americans, or then the form, uh, formerly enslaved, um, those same ideals that were gained for African Americans through that period of time with 1865 and 1877 was the same thing fought for in the modern civil rights movement, civil rights, right? And so what I try to do is spend a little bit more time on helping uh, folks understand that in the second gallery on how, because people always ask like, well, what happened? 
if African American men were able to vote and they were out voting um, white Mississippians between the time of 1868 and 1870 and 1875, and if the if half of the Mississippi legislature was African American um, between 1874 and 1875, if the lieutenant governor was African American um, during that time of uh, 1874 and 1875, like what? what happened. And so connecting the dots for them is a big pleasure of mine because for so long we've we've let, that part of history has been left out, you know. It's been glossed over and so a lot of folks have been un, um, unjustly educated about uh, their own history. And so it's been quite a pleasure for me to connect those dots using the museums, using the artifacts that we have, but helping them realize that this whole connection of Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and redemption is the really missing piece to the uh, modern civil rights movement. This was nothing new. Um, the struggle for freedom has been going on in this country since the first enslaved Africans were brought to this country in 1619, and there has been a struggle for freedom ever since. To learn more about the two Mississippi museums, you can visit our websites. Um, if you would like to know more about the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, which is the government agency that runs the two Mississippi museums, uh, please look that website up at mdah.ms.gov. Um, there you'll be able to not only understand the museum sites that we have under our um, auspices, but also the archives that we pull our resources from. The Mississippi Department of Archives and History has the largest and most expansive uh, archives and, and, and research material on the state of Mississippi. You can come in and research, and if you wanna come and learn more about the Museum of Mississippi History or the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, uh, we are open as well, and you can uh, wear your mask and come in and learn more about your state's history or Mississippi history if, you, if you're not familiar with Mississippi, the two Mississippi museums and the um, archive, Mississippi Department of Archives and History archives are, is a one-stop shop that we can, you know, send you out to any of like the arteries um, so you can learn more about uh, Mississippi history, get a better understanding. Thank you so much to Robbie and John for being so generous with their time and sharing their expertise with us. I am keenly aware that these interviews only scratch the surface of their wealth of knowledge. So I encourage you to visit Jackson, visit the Margaret Walker Center, visit the two Mississippi museums to dig into this history and meet these incredible public historians. Our city is and our state are so lucky to have them doing this work. Um, at this point, I would love to take a moment to answer some of the questions that have come in on this live stream. Again, if you have questions that you'd like to have me answer right now, um, please put them in, in the comments. Um, so the first question is from Ruth. Hello. Um, would the ISJL be able to make recommendations for additional resources so that we can read, watch, listen, and or learn more about these important people and events in Mississippi civil rights history? What a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Uh, the ISJL Virtual Vacation has a weekly email that goes out to uh, those who have signed up in addition to these weekly live streams. And that email goes out every Thursday. It's a little teaser about the upcoming session, as well as a whole section that's called Go Deeper. And the Go Deeper section has all kinds of different resources to articles, videos, um, podcast episodes, playlists, movies, you name it, um, that have to do with that week's uh, session topic. Um, so the email that went out last Thursday has a lot of really rich information about the Tube System Museums, um, about the Margaret Walker Center, about the history of Mississippi. Um, if you uh, haven't received that email um, or if you've missed it, um, it's linked on the ISGL Virtual Vacation website. So you can get to that at any point. Um, there are a lot of really, really amazing resources. One resource that I highlighted in the email that I would like to, again, verbally share now is the Mississippi Encyclopedia. This is an amazing project that is now totally available free online. So if you're wondering about some part of Mississippi history, I often point people to that as sort of a first stop 
um, the way that we also point people to the ISJL's Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities as a really amazing, concise, and rich overview of a topic or person or moment, um, and then pointing you to, to other resources from there. So that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, our weekly email is the answer to that. Um, we also have a question um, wanting to know more about early Jewish Sephardic communities in the South. Um, do not fear if you are interested in the Sephardic Jewish history in the South, you're going to love uh, future sessions of the ISL virtual vacation. We have big plans. So thank you so much for helping me uh, do a plug for that. We um, are so excited to um, tell that story in more detail than we already have on the virtual vacation. Um, let me confirm that those are all the questions that I've seen. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for those questions. If you have more, you can leave them on the live stream at any point, um, and I will be checking back in to answer them. Um, and you can also ask additional questions um, by emailing us at heritage at isjl.org, and we'll answer them in future sessions of the virtual vacation. And I will talk to you about that in a little bit more detail uh, momentarily. So I'm going to head and go back to sharing my screen. Awesome. So normally when I am guiding a Southern Jewish heritage tour, we have the opportunity to sit down together at meals and during travel on the bus to reflect on what we've experienced. And I feel like we've been missing that a little bit in the virtual vacation. So we're going to create that experience for ourselves next Tuesday. I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Josh Parshall, who's the director of the ISJL's history department. And he's the editor of our Encyclopedia of Southern Jewish Communities for a conversational interactive session where we're gonna sort of connect some of these threads. We're gonna reflect on what we've learned so far and talk about what's next for the virtual vacation. Um, there's so much to unpack and consider as we move forward. I'm thinking about some questions already, questions like, you know, how do the stories of the Summit's Montgomery March and Freedom Summer intersect? What do we know about how rabbis and other clergy played a role in the movement and sort of what it meant to be sort of a clergy member, a civil rights activist? How do we commemorate this, this history in the present? There are so many things that I want to talk about, but I especially want to talk about things that you, our wonderful participants, are interested in. So if you have questions you'd like us to answer, thoughts to share, ideas for what you'd like to see in future virtual vacation sessions, please leave them in the comment section on this video or email us at heritage at isjl.org. And you can always find out more about this program um, and share your thoughts with us on our website, which is isjl.org forward slash virtual dash vacation. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we will see you next Tuesday, same time, same place for our virtual bus ride. Thank you so much, everybody.